that are new with us uh, today. We are in a study of the book of Colossians, and we are continuing our study this morning. Uh, Paul's letter to the church of Colossae, a very young church and a church that uh, needed a very important letter. And so this is a very important letter written to a young church, emphasizing the preeminence or the sovereignty of Jesus Christ, the one who is over all things, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. He is before all things, and he holds all things together. As we've seen, this particular church, this young church at Colossae, was experiencing a threat from false teachers, a threat that would draw them away from Jesus Christ as their Lord and direct them towards emotionalism or mysticism. Mysticism being the belief that direct knowledge of God is attainable through immediate intuition or insight apart from the revealed word of God. And the threat to the church at Colossae was a mixture of Jewish tradition as well as Greek philosophy. These false teachers, as we've seen, they didn't deny Jesus. They didn't deny that he was there and existed and so forth, but they dethroned him as Lord. He was not regarded as divine or as the creator of all things. His death had no saving merit, and they knew of Christ, they knew of Jesus, but he was without any message, power, or authority. <clears throat> so Paul states unequivocally that Jesus Christ is supreme. He is God, he is creator, he is sustainer of all things, he is over all things in heaven and on earth, he is the head of the church, and he is sufficient to meet every need that mankind faces. Well, Paul knew and he understood who Jesus was. And what he saw was the danger of these false teachers leading the Colossian believers from the lordship of Jesus Christ. Seeing Jesus as Lord over their lives. He wasn't fearful that they would lose their salvation or that they wouldn't understand that their, what their relationship was to Jesus Christ in that area of forgiveness. But he was concerned that their faith would not affect their daily life and living. He was fearful that they would try to live the Christian life, as it were, on their own, rather than allowing the sovereign Lord to work within their heart and in their life. But as we have seen, you cannot meet Jesus and still be the same in your life and daily living. Jesus transforms lives. Jesus is the one who brings meaning and purpose into your life. And that's what the Apostle Paul is trying to say to this young church. And so Paul expresses deep concern for the Colossian believers, and he urged them, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to walk in him. Colossians chapter 2, page 833 in your pew Bible. We want to look to that, turn to that if you would, where Paul shares with the church his anxiety and his prayer for them, his concern and delight in them, and his instruction for continual spiritual growth. Colossians chapter 2, I'd like to read the first seven verses. Colossians chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. He says in 2 verse 1, I want you to know how much I am struggling for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not met me personally. My purpose is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I tell you this so that no one may deceive you by fine-sounding arguments. For though I am absent from you in body, I am present with you in spirit and delight to see how orderly you are and how firm your faith in Christ is. So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught and overflowing with thankfulness." There probably shouldn't be a chapter division between chapter 1 and chapter 2. Paul ends chapter 1 by saying, We proclaim him, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom, so that we may present everyone perfect in Christ. He says, To this end I am laboring, struggling with all his energy, which so powerfully works in me. 
And then in verse two, or chapter 2, verse 1, he says, I want you to know how much I am struggling for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not met me personally. The end of chapter 1, the beginning of chapter 2, Paul is involved in a great struggle. Not a struggle with the false teachers face to face because Paul was in prison and he didn't have contact with them. But his struggle was one of anxiety and prayer. Praying and fighting on behalf of the Colossians and the believers at Laodicea in the very presence of God. That they would remain true to Christ, that they would remain true to the word of God and his truth. Paul seems to suggest here that if the believers knew how heavy his heart was because of the possibility of them falling away or or not following Jesus completely for their life, that their faith might become useless if they try to do it in in their own strength and by themselves, that they wouldn't even listen to these false teachers. If you only knew my struggle, if you only knew how much I loved you, if you only knew how much I cared for you, you wouldn't even listen to those people. You would listen to the words that I share through the living word of God. I want you to remember last week, if you will, and I know it's hard to remember a message from one Sunday to the next, so I'm going to remind you of this particular section. Last week, we talked about suffering and sharing. (coughs) Suffering and sharing. What that suffering and sharing does for us and what that suffering and sharing does for others. To others, when we suffer as Paul is suffering, when we communicate to other people, it shows them that we're deeply concerned about them and their relationship to God. It shows that we pray for them, that we care for them, we long for them to know Jesus, we grieve over them, we hurt when they hurt. And when we suffer in that way, we're showing to those who we're concerned about and praying that we really care and that God cares and God is the answer to your need. Well, Paul is saying right here, if you only knew my struggle, if you only knew how much I cared that your relationship with God would be what it should be, if you would only know my purpose in that struggle, which is to encourage you in heart and to unite you in love, that you would understand the truth of God through Jesus Christ to his wisdom and knowledge, then you would know the true God and you would follow him faithfully day by day. What he's saying here is a contrast statement with the Gnostics who said that they had a knowledge about God. Paul is saying, it's not about God. I want you to know that Jesus is the source of true knowledge. Know it in your heart. Be united in the love of Jesus and know that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life and no one comes to the Father except through him. There is no other way but Jesus. And that's what Paul is saying here. He is supreme. He is truth, and he is the way to God. Well, the concern of the Apostle Paul for the church was the danger of the false teachers' fine-sounding arguments, uh, empty words that would lead them away from God and away from his son, Jesus Christ. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 6, Paul says, Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things God wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Empty words. Empty words. That was a concern, not only for the early church, but it's also for the church today. I'm sure we've all heard in the past about the use of the uh, retailers uh, bait and switch. Bait and switch. Apparently it's uh, illegal to do today, but when you hear that word bait and switch, like so many other little phrases that we use from things of bygone days, what you're saying is bait and switch is for the purpose of deceiving. It's for the purpose of deceiving. A a store would entice a person into coming into their place of business by advertising a well-known item, whatever it might be, some product at a very low price. And you say, wow, I didn't know that that was that cheap. I think I'll go to that particular store and I'll buy that particular item. And when the customer comes and asks, where's the display or where can I pick up this item? They say, unfortunately, it's out of stock. (laughs) But over here is something of a lesser a quality, but for the same price. Purchase it. And the bottom line is money. They want you to, in the store to be able to sell an item and to be able to have a bigger profit. Their thought was, if I can just get them into the store, then they will purchase something and they will buy something. Well, false teachers use empty words, fine-sounding arguments to capture the interest of others and to gain a hearing. They talk about Jesus 
They'll talk about redemption, the cross, the resurrection of Jesus, without knowing or believing their true meaning and their true teaching, and how that transforms lives. And so when an interested person responds, they're confronted by beliefs and patterns of behavior that are contrary to God and contrary to the Word of God. Just because someone name drops a, a Christian teacher or uses scriptural terms of Christian faith, you need to ask the Holy Spirit to help you to discern whether or not the speaker is really being true to the Bible and to the whole counsel of God. What is being taught? Paul says, don't be deceived by fine-sounding arguments. And John tells us in 1 John chapter 4, verse 1, Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, and by that test their teachings, to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. In verse 5, Paul says, Though I am absent from you in body, I am present with you in spirit, and delight to see how orderly you are, and how firm your faith is in Christ. Paul had anxiety, Paul had his struggles, Paul was concerned about the early church, but he delights in their faith, and he instructs them to reject false teaching and to keep on keeping on in the truth of God. You know the word of God, keep on in the word of God. <clears throat> and then we come to verses six and seven of Colossians. It's always been verses that have strengthened me in my Christian walk because they keep my Christian life in perspective. When we started this series, I told you the Colossians is my favorite book of the Bible. And I know it's hard to pick a favorite book because all scripture is inspired by God. But certain verses, certain passages come to your mind. Certain books come to your mind. Colossians is one of them. And so there are different things that come up, and, and I'll point them out to you. This is one that, that is very important to, in my life because we all have questions as we're living our lives moment by moment and day by day. How can I go on when relationships fail? Husbands and wives going at each other. Parents upset with their children and their antics. Children upset with their parents and their family life. How can I go on when friends and loved ones do things that bring hurt and pain into my life and into the lives of others? Lord, sickness and suffering seem so pointless. Why must I or a loved one go through it? How can I make it through the difficult days ahead? Lord, society, locally, nationally, and even worldwide, it's falling apart. Why are there wars? Why is there destruction? Lord, I don't understand. We all have these questions. We all have these concerns, and I'm sure there are many more, and we don't know the answer, and so what do we do? Oftentimes, we just throw up our hands and say, God, I can't do it anymore. I'm not strong enough to go through what you're asking me to go through. I'm not wise enough to discern what's happening and taking place. God, please, as your child, give me the strength and wisdom that I need day by day to live for you and to live victoriously in the midst of my daily struggles and questions. Lord, I need you. And that's exactly what the Apostle Paul is saying to us this morning as he said to the early church. He's saying you began your Christian life by faith. What you did when you began your Christian life was, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. You recognize that you were an enemy of God, separated by him. You recognize that you could not save yourself. And so you repented of your sin, and you asked for forgiveness. And God, who is faithful and just to forgive you, forgave you of your sins and cleansed you from all unrighteousness. You know that to be true. That's how you came into the family of God, through repentance and through confession of sin. <clears throat> and just as the Colossians received Jesus as Lord, as we have, they must acknowledge his lordship in every detail of their life, both spiritually and physically. You receive Christ Jesus as Lord through faith, looking to God, not looking to yourself for your way. So that's how you continue to live your life. It's not like you're born and then you're laid aside in some bassinet and you're on your own to grow. No, you are there for the purpose of being strengthened and continue in the Lord through faith and you follow his ways. I think a key word in reference to Jesus and our faith in him that's often missing or misunderstood or a word that is used even as we say, how are you today, and we say, fine. <laughs> when things aren't going, just kind of like a greeting, there's one word, one word <laughs> that is important, and we miss it. 
we miss it. I miss it time and time again. And that one word is Lord. Lord, L-O-R-D. Jesus, who we accepted as God, creator, sustainer, and savior, is Lord of all. Just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to walk with him, continue to be with him. There are believers today, you may be one of them, who've received Jesus as Savior, but you've never acknowledged him as Lord of your life. Never acknowledged him as Lord of all and have never permitted him to become the Lord of your life. Lord, by definition, means master or owner. Master or owner. And it may sound strange to your ears, but Jesus owns you. If you're a child of God this morning, Jesus is your master. He is your owner. Jesus made you. He redeemed you. He bought you with his precious blood, and he wants to take his rightful place on the throne of your life. Who's in control of your life when, when problems of life come upon you? It must be Jesus. It must be him as Lord. You must submit to his will, his love, his sovereignty, because he is Lord. He is your master. You know, we receive Jesus, his death, burial, resurrection, the forgiveness of sins by God through faith in the finished work of Jesus upon the cross. But the Christian life is much more than an initial commitment to Jesus as our Savior. It's more than words. It's more than feelings. It's a way of life. The Apostle Paul often refers to the Christian life as a walk. By that he means that Christianity is a daily way of life. It's visible con conduct. People should be able to see your life and see that you are a follower of Jesus and that you are obeying him. Paul wanted the believers at Colossae to know that Jesus, the one that they received as a person, is not a creed or a theme, but he is the one who was with them and the one who is in them. And they should conduct themselves in their daily living as though Jesus Christ was visibly present with them every moment of the day. Do we recognize that? Do we understand that? That Jesus is Lord, and as Lord, he is with us and he is in us. As followers of Jesus Christ, we must keep on keeping on. He says, just as continue in. Just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in him. And that's through faith, the daily discipline of yielding and obeying Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. That's where we have that spiritual success. That's where Jesus is Lord as we bow before him and we obey him. Well, Paul does change the figure or illustration that he often uses from a walk when he says, be rooted and built up in Jesus. Be rooted and build up in Jesus. The idea that Paul wants to get across here is stability and growth in your Christian life. Stability and growth. <clears throat> Since we're rooted in Jesus, there's stability. Nothing can upset us. To have our life destroyed, the life of faith destroyed, it would be necessary for the devil to destroy Jesus, the one in whom we are rooted, and we know that will never happen. Jesus is victor. When we are rooted in Lord Jesus Christ, we have an unshakable foundation. Ron read that for us this morning in Psalm chapter 1. The first three verses talk about the man who delights in God and his word, a man who was blessed by God, a man of faith in his daily living, and a man who lived in obedience to God. Let me remind you of those words. I'm sure many of you have it memorized as you memorize your scriptures. But blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of mockers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water which yield its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. We are like a tree that is rooted in Jesus as Lord. Unshakable. Unshakable. A sure foundation. In Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, he tells a story, a parable of two builders. One builds a home or one builds his life upon the sand. 
The other builds his home or builds his life upon the solid rock foundation. And the one who builds his house upon the rock is able to withstand the strongest storms of life. We're familiar with that story. We're familiar with that parable, but the opening statement to that parable, Jesus asks a question. And the question that he asks is this, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? That's an interesting question. An interesting question, and one that cuts right to the heart and to the issues of life. If Jesus is Lord, and he is, and you say that he is Lord of your life, why don't you do what he says? Why don't I do what he says when we say Jesus is Lord? Verse 6, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, Continue to live in him, rooted and built up in him. And that's a question that only you can answer for yourself. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? Paul desires for the believers at Colossae was that they would be encouraged in heart, united in love, and understand God and his will. And that through their faith, they would resist the false teachings about Jesus, be firm, well-grounded, by root and foundation in their daily walk with God. Jesus is Lord. Well, Paul wanted them to have a strong faith, an overflowing faith, an abounding, growing faith. And may God help us also this morning to recognize the solemn fact that God honors faith. Not faith in you know, things that uh, we might be able to do, but faith in who he is, an active living faith that is in Jesus, who is your Lord. A faith in your Lord. We're saved by grace through faith. The just shall live by faith. Whatever is not of faith is sin. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. An act of living faith that's in Jesus Christ, your Lord. Now Paul concludes this section by saying, because of your foundation in Jesus and the truth of God's word, continue to live in him, overflowing with thankfulness. Overflowing with thankfulness. True believers can't help but be thankful. Can't help but be thankful that they have heard the truth and accepted the truth of God that we've heard and accepted of his love, his forgiveness, his sustaining power in our lives day by day. We need to be thankful for our salvation and that God is continuing to work in our lives. Why? Because he is your Lord. He's your master. He wants what's best for you and what would bring him glory. There are tens and thousands of people in our country and millions throughout the world who have never been exposed to the real truth of God and his love for them and their forgiveness. They're born into homes and families where cults or false religions have been practiced for generations. In many cases, they're forbidden to attend Bible-believing churches or even forbidden to listen to gospel radio broadcasts or to read any type of gospel literature, let alone reading the scriptures. They're cut off from the truth of who God is. And Paul admonishes the believers at Colossae and each one of us to be thankful that we have heard the truth of God and his word, that we've accepted that truth, and that we're living daily in the truth of who God is. Be thankful. Be thankful. So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. Keep on keeping on living in the truth of God. Again, I know many of you are going through difficult times personally, or someone in your family or a dear friend is going through tough times. They'd have you questioning God's purpose. And you're emotionally and spiritually drained. Maybe you're discouraged and defeated. You know, we look at our world around us, our society, our circumstances, and we say, God, what's going on? What's going on? 
Well, the Apostle Paul was here this morning, and I'm here this morning to tell you that there is victory in Jesus, and that there is joy in your salvation, in the joy of worshiping and in serving Jesus, because the God who you have received by faith and accepted as Lord and worship and serve is the same God that is with you, the same God that is in you, to answer all of life's questions and to give you joy and to give you peace in the midst of those questions. Know God, know his truth, be firm in your faith, let your faith go deep and be rooted in Jesus as that firm foundation of life. Let your faith overflow with thanksgiving and the difficulties of life that you're now facing will give way to joy and will give way to the peace of God. When we keep our minds and our hearts upon God and Jesus Christ, he gives us peace, an inner peace and an inner joy, a joy and peace that comes from a sovereign and loving God, the one who is over all, in all, and sustainer of all. Keep your eyes on Jesus and keep on keeping on in God's truth. The word tells us that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I trust he's your Lord this morning as well. Not only your Savior, I trust that is true. You've accepted Jesus Christ, you've confessed your sin, but is he Lord of your life? Is he Lord? I trust he is. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the truth of your word to our hearts once again. To be reminded that we are to keep on keeping on within our Christian life. To be able to know that you love us, you care for us, and even as we began our life with you through faith, that we continue to live our life with you through faith, knowing that you are Lord of our life, our master, our owner. And with thanksgiving, we give you praise, we give you joy, because, because you are a loving master. You want what's best for us, you want what that in our life that will bring you honor and bring you glory. And so, Father, as we prepare our hearts to gather around the Lord's table this morning, I ask that you would help us to be able to remember, to be thankful for our salvation through the precious body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, but then to be able to know that that is a reminder of an event that took place when we confessed our sins and repented of our sins and were born into your family. But now, Lord, it is also through that faith that we live day by day in your strength and in your power and in your victory and in your joy through faith. Quiet our hearts before you. Speak to us this morning that we would know that you indeed are Lord of all we recognize that, we understand it, but Lord of our life as well. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.